Good afternoon, BNG426 class. I uh, hope you all had a great spring break. Happy snow day today. Uh, we're canceled, uh, at least physically, um, today. So we are putting the lecture for today online on my courses. I record it. You watch it. Simple as that. We're going to talk today about metabolic flux analysis. It's going to be our first uh, of the week's topic here. Uh, we'll spend all week on this, culminating in a um, flipped classroom activity on Friday. So uh, first, a couple of things. Uh, the online class assignment that seems to have been due forever ago is actually due on Thursday. Uh, if you have questions, please email me uh, about it. It should be pretty straightforward. Uh, if you do the matrix math uh, on ma um, <coughs> MATLAB, or just happen to be very good at matrix math, uh, should be pretty easy. Um, we will not in this class. I've decided over the break, this is one of the things I managed to accomplish while everyone was on spring break, uh, was to decide that there's not going to be a final exam in this class. Uh, but we will have a final paper instead, and there's already some details on that in, um, in, in my courses, posted on my courses. So... We will talk further about that on Wednesday. Um, I plan on putting some resources for you uh, in order to be able to research and do this on my courses. Uh, if we have questions on that, please let's talk about them on Wednesday. So let's talk about metabolic fluxes. Metabolic fluxes are the fundamental determinant of cell physiology. The carbon is always in flow, as it were. Um, they provide the metabolic flux or the concept of metabolic flux provides a degree of engagement of various pathways in the overall cellular function or in various cellular functions. Uh, we need an accurate quantitation of the magnitude of metabolic fluxes. This is an important goal when considering uh, using a microbe or some other organism. Uh, as a biocatalyst to make things to bioconvert um, or to simply to exist really if we want to get into that level of detail but usually we want to get into that level of detail because we are interested in using it in a um, industrial process so a powerful tool to be able to determine metabolic flux, pathway flux, is metabolic flux analysis. So essentially what we're doing is we're looking at measured rates. We have certain measured rates that we can measure and can look at, and usually it's the appearance and or disappearance of things. So for example, a uh, uptake of a substrate, in this case uh, shown in this little schematic is U, um, and secretion of product or products, uh, which in this case take the form of this V and W variable, we can measure those and we can have those in our arsenal uh, so that we are able to do metabolic flux analysis. Typically, it's going to be something that has some sort of bearing outside the cell itself. Uh, it is a little bit more difficult to um, have a measured rate inside uh, the cell. So we tend to confine them to the outside of the cell. Like I said, uptake of substrate or the disappearance of substrate and the appearance or secretion of given products. And then, you know, we've talked about stoichiometry, cell stoichiometry. We use a stoichiometric model to calculate the uh, internal fluxes based on what we've measured. So there is a method to my madness when I was talking to you again about the cell growth and production stoichiometries. We apply that in this case in the metabolic flux analysis arena in order to get a lot of calculated data that will tell us where the carbon is going or that will give us an idea at least as to where the carbon is going. So ultimately we want to have in metabolic flux analysis is a metabolic flux map that essentially shows us where the carbon is going. It shows us biochemical reactions and the carbon flowing through it, or the molecules flowing through it, the compounds flowing through it. Uh, plus, we want to know a steady state rate at which 
um, metabolites flow through the reaction, each reaction in the diagram here. And here you can see we have glycolysis plus TCA cycle, etc. So we can get useful information about the contribution of various pathways. And this one, you know, the central metabolic pathways, these are big pathways to consider. Uh, then how they contribute to the overall metabolic process and that tells us how they might affect the either the uptake of a substrate or the use of a substrate as well as the uh, production and therefore secretion of products here. So ultimately we want to have a map in hand that'll tell us these things. So the real value is not just having one map but actually having several maps, different flux maps that compare and contrast things. Uh, these things can be cells that are put under different conditions, either aerobic versus anaerobic, different carbon sources compared to each other. We can look at different strains of the same organism, or we can look at different cell types. For example, below here, uh, these maps here, these pathway maps show normal cells, versus different kinds of cancer cells and how and the size of the arrow shows the uh, quantity or it gives you an estimate of the quantity of carbon flowing through these different pathways and you can see that it varies depending on the cell type here so we get that information from metabolic flux analysis and it gets put into a form of a flux map that we can look at and we can make observations and then we can make determinations based on that we can also get other information uh, through a metabolic flux analysis uh, we can identify branch point control something that's called nodal rigidity I'll explain that in a minute uh, basically it's the resistance or amenability to changes in the flux split ratio um, then there is the identification of alternative pathways which can provide some clarity when actual biochemical routes may be unclear you know, we, we know a product is made, we just don't know how it gets made, but metabolic flux analysis can help us solve that, um, or help us illuminate that black box, really, if you will. Calculation of non-measured extracellular fluxes. So we have our measured extracellular fluxes, like I said, the uptake of substrate or the release or, or secretion of, com of product compound. We can use data... Uh, from previous experiments uh, when measured flux data is lacking. So we can calculate those fluxes um, without needing to actually have measured them. And then we can calcu also calculate maximum theoretical yields of product, which is very important if you want to make a lot of product. So the flux split ratios, we can try to fix them. And again, we'd know which ones we can fix based on our first point here, the branch point control. But we can fix these flux split ratios to maximize the amount of product that we form or that our organism will form and thus secrete. And we can remove uh, or we can, we can observe constraints on any intermediates. Uh, maybe we can remove them, maybe we can't. Um, but that is something we would know. Uh, once we look at the metabolic flux maps and uh, do our metabolic flux analysis. So I talked about flux split ratio. Uh, you may remember this from those of you that were with me in uh, BNG 312, which essentially is when carbon flow encounters a branched pathway. Uh, so in glycolysis, we have fructose 6-phosphate converted to DHAP and GAP. Uh, this could be a flux split uh, if DHAP and GAP both go uh, to form different types of compounds, which in some cases happens. Um, but anyway, the fructose 6-phosphate is the branch point here, and the ratio of where the carbon goes, either to product 1 or product 2, uh, gives us an idea of where uh, the greater percentage of the carbon ends up. So uh, in this case, we have substrate 100 C moles of substrate converted to an intermediate. Only 45 C moles goes to product 1, whereas 55 C moles goes to product 2. So uh, we want to see um, what we can do given that the flux split ratio at the intermediate for product 2 is 0.5. 
55%, basically 55 divided by 100 here in this case. And this tells us about, this will give us an example of nodal rigidity if we look at a, a variety of conditions and determine how the flux split ratio changes or even if it changes. Some flux splits will resist changes in the flux splits uh, and these are known as rigid branch points. Others can be more accommodating and the flux analysis will help us to determine which nodes are rigid versus which are flexible. So if we look here at the bottom substrate is converted to intermediate 1 which is split and you have intermediate 2A and 2B. 2B is a split to product 1 and product 2. So we can see we've done three different conditions. 100% of the substrate goes to intermediate 1 and then intermediate 2A we in some conditions get up to um, a flux split ratio of 40% for 2A or as little as 20% for 2A which means as much as 80% for 2B but then we look at the con conversion of intermediate 2B to products the uh, ratio tends not to change too much it's see it's about 50-50 so we look at you know condition 1 we have 30 C moles going to product 2 30 C moles going to product 1 out of 60 C moles 50% either way same with the second condition, and same with this third condition. So the intermediate 2B is a node that is very resistant to changes in flux split, uh, at least given the conditions that we've looked at here. Um, that is not so with intermediate 1 here. The flux splits tend to change quite, quite dramatically, actually. All right, so where do we start when considering metabolic flux analysis? We start with reaction network stoichiometries, which we've already talked about here. We describe substrates converting to products and biomass, essentially. So we have considered a defined, or uh, at least in terms of the system that we have discussed, a uh, defined number of intracellular reactions depending on the organism, depending on the conditions. That's J number of intracellular reactions. And those will proceed via K number of pathway metabolites. So these variables will be populated in different ways depending on what pathways we're looking at, what reactions we're looking at, and how many pathway metabolites are involved in those uh, reactions, in those pathways. So this usually involves dealing in vectors. So our pathway mass balances in vector notation. Um, we can see that in these this equation right here, in these variables here, where x mat is a concentration vector for intracellular metabolites, i.e. the pathway intermediates that we've been talking about. R mat is the vector that contains the net rates of formation of these metabolites. And this is in the J number of reactions that occur in the pathways we're looking at. Of course, mu, our old friend here, is the growth rate, as you would expect. And this equation will give us the dx mat over dt, the change in the concentrations uh, of the intracellular metabolites here, based on the rates of formation, the growth rate, um, multiplied by the concentration, which is uh, as we can see uh, here, it is the concentration, uh, growth-based concentration uh, of these metabolites. So we take turnover into account because there is very high turnover of the pools of most metabolites here. Concentrations are rapidly adjusting even when large perturbations are considered here. For the purpose of looking at our, all of our metabolites it is reasonable to assume that these pathway metabolites are at pseudo steady state. Uh, basically, the implication of that is that there's no metabolite accumulation here, or dx met dt is equal to zero. So the equation now becomes zero equals r met minus mu times x met. And we'll see how that is, uh, we'll see if we can simplify that even further here. Um, first, we have to ask ourselves, what really are we measuring? 
uh, with these things. And I kind of stumbled over that earlier. But the first term, the R met, expresses the net synthesis rate of the pathway intermediates of the J reactions. It's a pretty easy thing to grasp hold of here. The sum of the fluxes leading into and out of a pathway metabolite. We've talked about that before. We've talked about that thing already. It's the second term that might be a little bit new to us. Uh, it Basically, it describes the dilution of metabolic pool, any metabolic pool, due to biomass growth. It's basically that that's why the growth rate is there. It's the growth rate part of the term. Um, you can almost think of it as kind of a ludicking parade type equation where we have growth non <coughs> non involved and growth involved. Um, however, it should be noted, um, and for the for the purposes of now and forevermore in this class, that the dilution effect represented by this mu x mat term is actually generally very small usually because intracellular levels of most metabolites tend to be very low. We don't tend to have huge pools of things. The cell really doesn't want huge pools of any kind of metabolite hanging around. Um, basically hanging around being unused. Um, so we could simplify this to simply zero equals our met. So our rates equal, you know, the, the vector of our rates equals uh, zero. And this really kind of looks like at this point our general, the mass balances that we have talked about since the first day of B and G312 even. So can we really neglect the dilution term? Well, the book gives a few examples. I'll give you one here uh, where we're looking at Saccharomyces cerevisiae. You see at the bottom of this table here, uh, it gives the concentration uh, in terms of uh, micromoles of substance per gram of cell dry weight. Uh, in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, we're looking at ATP here. There's eight micromole concentration. That's the typical intracellular level per gram cell dry weight. Um, so we consider the flux of ATP is about seven millimoles per gram per hour if we have a growth rate of Saccharomyces cerevisiae of 0.1 per hour. The mu x uh, of ATP would be 0.8 micromoles of ATP per gram per hour. That is a significant dilution here. That is almost a 10,000 fold lower uh, order of magnitude here. Uh, so typically we might as well neglect that. We can neglect that. If, if things are a little higher, we can put in some sort of term that will uh, allow us to adjust and not have in completely incorrect answers at the other end. But in general, we can neglect that dilution term, the mu x, thus simplifying our lives dramatically when we're thinking about metabolic flux analysis. So we're assuming pseudo steady state means that only metabolites positioned at the branch points need to be considered. And this goes back to something I've said previously, talking about combining the linear rates into just one overall rate that encompasses all the uh, reactions of a given linear pathway. So we look at, for example, we look at fructose 6-phosphate um, making fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, then fructose 1,6-bisphosphate makes the dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. We have two reactions here where fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is involved. And when we break down uh, each of our reactions, we are considering where, which reaction involves which metabolite. And that's how we kind of set up our matrices, we set up our balances, uh, and we're good to go. So our steady state mass balance for fructose bisphosphate would look like this, where V1, which this is our V1, gives us the appearance of fructose bis bisphosphate, that's why it's positive, minus V2, which gives us the disappearance of fructose bisphosphate, and that equals zero. So the rate of appearance minus the rate of disappearance of fructose bisphosphate is going to equal zero if we are at pseudo steady state. Our linear pathways here can be lumped into one reaction with one rate here. 
So again, we're thinking in a vector basis here. If we think about our rates, our uh, matrix of rates, um, it, this is kind of the basis for our flux analysis, where we have our rate balances. Our ST here is a um, transposed matrix, but it is the matrix of our stoichiometric coefficients. The book calls it GT for some reason. I don't quite know why. V is the vector of our intracellular rates. The vector equation represents the linear K linear algebraic balances with J unknowns, our pathway fluxes here. And we determine something called degrees of freedom, which F equals J minus K, uh, which means that some elements in our vector V have to be measured before we can calculate all the rest of it. So we need to have some measured values, some measured rates. And again, we talked about what measured rates we can, we can use in order to get this thing going. So those can be our measure rates, but we have to have enough of them to satisfy our degrees of freedom here. If we have too few, we're in trouble, um, but if we have just enough or more, we're in good shape. So given the degrees of freedom, like I said, we talked about the different measured fluxes, some fluxes have to be measured. If exactly F fluxes are measured, then the system is exactly determined. It is determined, as it's called. The solution is thus unique and simple to obtain. This is great if you want to get the right answer and get the heck out of here. Uh, maybe you've got some place to go this weekend. Uh, if you have greater than F fluxes measured, the system is overdetermined. And this is great if you want to get the best answer possible or the best answers possible because extra equations exist that can be used for testing consistency of the overall balances but maybe you will miss that handy dandy social event um, that you were trying to get to this weekend so sorry to say if you're one of those you have more than F fluxes and you have to do some checking of your work or you you have the option to do some checking of your work really but if less than F fluxes are measured, the system is underdetermined. Additional constraints would have to be introduced in order to obtain solutions. So if you don't have enough measured fluxes, um, you have to figure some way to make the amount of measured fluxes you have be enough. And we will talk about that on Wednesday a little bit. <coughs> okay. So if exactly F fluxes are measured, then the rates can be solved using this, this equation here. 0 equals ST multiplied by V. The solution will be obtained by the creation of a new vector of calculated fluxes. So we just have, and you may remember this from uh, 312, we have STM times VM, which these are the measured fluxes. This is the co these are the coefficients from the measured uh, fluxes, and these are the rates of the measured fluxes, plus STC times VC, where STC is the coefficient of the matrix of flux, coefficient matrix of the fluxes to be calculated, and VC is the matrix of the fluxes to be calculated. So we're really interested in those calculated fluxes, the VC. We basically should have everything else. If the system is exactly determined, we have our VM, our vector VM, we have our corresponding with vector VM, we have our STVM, our vector of um, stoichiometric coefficients, and we have our STC, which is our vector uh, of stoichiometric coefficients for the calculated fluxes. So we should be able to solve for VC in this case. So we've done our stoichiometry, we've, cal we've measured our fluxes, we thus can solve the equation for VC in this way. And what we're doing is we're moving one part of this equation over to the other side and then solving for VC, where VC equals negative, um, the negative inverse of STC multiplied by SM, STM, and VM. Basically, STC to the minus one is the inverted vector of STC, and this can be solved quickly and easily 
by using MATLAB. Just INV parentheses, whatever you're calling your STC vector. I think I called it SC in the homework that you will be getting on Wednesday. Okay, so let's look at an example where we look at the mixed acid fermentation by Lactococcus lactis. So we've measured three rates here. We've measured our rate of glucose uptake, you know, again the rate of disappearance of glucose, or RG, at 0 0.01 moles per gram per hour. The rate of lactate efflux, our L, is uh, 0 0.0049 moles per gram per hour. The rate of formate efflux, down here is another product, formate, RF, is 0 0.00041 moles per gram per hour. Here. So we have three measured fluxes. Is that enough? What we really want to know is the calculated fluxes here. So how do we get those? We have to make sure we have enough measured fluxes, but first, we have said that the assumption of a pseudo-steady state, in the, as in this case, means we only need to consider the branch points, which reactions can be lumped under one rate. So if we look at which are the linear pathways, the reaction pathways, and not the branched ones, what can we lump into one rate? So sadly, we can't do the think-pair-share part of this because you're somewhere else uh, that I'm not. Um, but we can think of at least four linear pathways. If you consider there is four linear pathways here. There's actually less than that, really. <clears throat> so there's this linear pathway, glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Then there is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate to pyruvate. But actually, this can be lumped into its just one giant linear pathway. But we also have uh, acetyl-CoA to acetate, acetyl-CoA to ethanol. So we have three or four, depending on how you're looking at it, linear pathways. But let's talk about why we can lump this giant pathway here, this red box, under one rate. Why? Isn't there this blue circle here? Isn't that a branch point? 